Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Far Side Folios. We are continuing our month-long celebration of National Poetry Month with a special series of author interviews as along with our daily posts. And today's special guest is author Heather Camille. Heather Camille is the author of a poetry collection entitled Brown Liquor Memories. She's a graduate of Old Dominion University. Um, she's a Richmond, Virginia native who strives to deliver works that are relatable and sentimental. So she is an advocate for helping people so they can in turn help themselves and she's a history enthusiast. So welcome to the far side, Heather Camille. Yes, thank you so much. It's nice to be here, Monica. All right, we are so excited to have you with us on today. So let's get into it. What was the inspiration behind Brown Liquor Memories? Uh, so I, I appreciate you asking that question. Um, it's a question I got a lot from my family and friends when I did publish the book. Um, and honestly, the inspiration comes from my family. Growing up, I was around my dad's family quite a bit. Uh, my dad is from a family of all brothers. Um, he was raised by a single mother. And when we had gatherings in our very small, tight-knit you know, neighborhood, they would mostly be at my, my uncle's house. And the one thing that always stood out to me was that they had some sort of brown liquor around, whether it was Hennessy or it was my dad's favorite, which was Cavassier. There was always a brown liquor in someone's hand while they shared stories about their childhoods or, you know, made fun of each other, you know, the things like brothers do, siblings do. Um, so that became something that followed me throughout my life. You know, um, anytime that I think about my, my dad or any of my uncles or my grandmother, I always think about the times where they shared memories and good times over brown liquor. So I thought it would be only fitting to, when I did decide to create a, a a collection of my own writing and put it out there to title it Brown Liquor because that's my tie to the past. Um, I, I do love history and that's my personal history. You know, there's there's a lot there's a lot there when it comes to brown liquor and, and history for me. All right. So speaking of brown liquor memories, let's open up with a share um, of one of your pieces. Sure. And I'll actually read um, one of my favorites here. It is called Avoidance. I'm just gonna pull it up here. I keep pictures of my true loves at the back of my journals, a dedication of thought, beautiful struggles never to be finished, imperfect matters. Many too far gone from the beginning of the end to chase and start again. A reckless collective of preserved Im imagery. Avoided pieces of a chaotic existence with a better chance of survival if I were to bottle them for target practice against the Atlantic. And it seems their very existence now mere reminders, refusing me absolution from all of the days of taking lovers for granted with faith that if not today, then the next will keep forgetting to remember our connection and just be. <laughs> Thank you. You know, we got to snap it up. We got to snap it up, snap it up. Um, so how long um, have you been um, in that creative space of writing poetry? And when did you realize that, oh, I'm, I think I'm a poet? That's a good question. Um, so for as long as I can remember, I've been writing. Um, I used to write short stories in school about going into space. Um, and I actually come from a family of creative creatives. They probably won't call themselves that, but but my mother is a very good drawer. Um, she was a seamstress growing up. She used to sew clothes for herself, for her sisters. My mother actually has 11 brothers and sisters and she decided that she would um, create a, what do you call it? Like a, a fashion house at a very young age. And her, her brothers and sisters were her models. And my father actually wrote poetry as well. Um, he didn't share it. I only happened to see it by accident while we were cleaning out um, an old shed before we moved into our current family home. Um, but my, my my father was a really, really good writer. And I think that was one of the things that, you know, growing up, I always loved work, the, the spoken word. I've always been an avid reader. My father was an avid reader, so was my mother. And it's something that it just kind of came naturally. 
Now, though I don't really consider myself a poet, I do consider myself someone that um, really enjoys words. I'm someone that I can find, I guess, a poetical aspect out of everything, the good out of everything, the the sweet, the sour, the bitter out of every situation. And it's a means of expression. You know, it's when I have a hard time sometimes putting my words together and say a face to face. But if I put that pen to paper, it's like I'm meeting with a best friend and everything just comes spilling out and it just comes out perfectly. And I can deliver a feeling, you know, a whole lot more easy um, putting it on paper or even in, into my cell phone as opposed to speaking to sometimes to someone face to face. So I would consider myself just like a, an advocate for words. Um, but yeah, from a, from a very tender age, I've been, I've been in love with words. And I, I totally get that. I think, you know, words have, you know, have shape, they have form, they have texture, you know, they have color. Mm -hmm. And so when you're able to, you know, weave all of those things together, you get a a beautiful tapestry. And so that's what you've been able to do with connecting, you know, your own, you know, family history um, in words and, you know, talk about life and, you know, relationships mm -hmm. and the different aspects of just the journey um, through your um, work with, you know, the Brown Liquor Memories. And um, I love the title. I really, Thank you. That, that, I mean, it's it like, it clicks, it sticks and being able to have the backdrop is um, really a good thing and maybe making those connections. So um, is there a common theme or theme style or tone that you find yourself gravitating to? Um, in your writing? So I've always been very interested in spoken word poetry. One of my favorite, absolute favorite writers is Saul Williams. And um, I was introduced to Saul Williams probably about 15 or so years ago through the movie Slam. And in the movie Slam, he's basically um, incarcerated and he uses poetry as a means for his outlet, like his sense of freedom while he's in the prison system. And then once he gets out of the prison system, he continues to pursue it. Um, I've always been interested in that sort of poetry simply because it breaks away from the type of poetry I grew up on, which was very structured. It had to be, you know, it was written in couplets or it was written in stanzas mm -hmm. or it had to specifically be a haiku or it was a stream of consciousness and it didn't have any any real meat and potatoes. It was just you putting a bunch of words that, that immediately came into your brain onto a piece of paper and calling it a poem. Whereas with spoken word, there's there's revolution in it, there's freedom in it, there's there's emotion that's unrestrained in it. And that's been something that I've always connected with. It has a beat to it. Um, and it's closely linked to hip hop. And you know, coming up in the the 80s and the 90s, mm -hmm. um, you know, to me personally, that's the best time for the hip hop. Yes, and yes, yes. Absolutely. I'm wearing a Wu-Tang t-shirt right now, actually. <laughs> you know, so having those connections, it's it's always been a part of my life. So I think that's what, you know, resonates through my work, that that poetry that has a beat to it. You can read it in a cadence. You can read it uh, over a beat if you wanted to. You can read it while you're sipping your brown liquor and listening to jazz music. Completely up to you. Um, but yeah, that that's basically the the way that I, I, I think. And that's the way that my, my writing comes out a lot of times in that you know, very musically hip hop like kind of spoken word type of type of writing. So basically, I mean, what we're what I'm hearing is that you don't have a limit. And I think for that's important for those who may be watching or catching the replay to know that you're not limited to a straight style, form and scope. Mm -hmm. You're bringing to this form, whether you, you know you're on, you're putting your work on the page or you're performing on the stage. You're bringing your authentic voice, and um, you don't have to fit into the the couplet. You don't have to fit mm -hmm. into the A B A B or the A B B A mm -hmm. structure for it to flow and it, for it to have meaning and for it to connect. So really thank you for sharing 
um, that, you know, with our audience. So, what, so what do you think contributes to, you know, a poem success, whether you're, you've got it on the page or if you're p performing it on a stage um, platform? I think you hit the, the nail on the head. It, it all goes back to authenticity. Um, I know personally, when I pick up a book, I'm drawn there by either the cover or the title. Mm -hmm. And when I start reading that book or, you know, just looking at the first couple of pages, I want to see that it's true to what my initial preconceived notions are about the work. And sometimes it's nice to be surprised too. You know, I would never say that, you know, I want something to just stick to what I feel like it should be about, but I think it's very important for things to be authentic. Um, I would hope that someone who is um, looking into my work or any work that you look into is able to not only see a part of themselves, but, but a part of the writer as well. Um, that authenticity, that, that, that means of making a connection between the words and what's trying to be conveyed. All right. So you spoke about, um, I know you gave us one of the poets that you listened to and um, paid attention to. What are some of your other um, favorite poets or spoken word artists that you've gone to for inspiration? Um, Amiri Baraka, Leroy Jones, he's one of my absolute favorites. He comes from a place of revolution. You know, Black Panther Party was alive and strong when Amiri Baraka was was writing. Um, I love that he he speaks about, you know, black resistance, black revolution, black power, black freedom. Um, that's that he's probably in the top three of my favorites uh, right behind Saul Williams. Um, Nikki Giovanni. Nikki Giovanni is one of my absolute favorites. Um, I've had the pleasure to meet her in person and uh, she, she's a joy. She's a complete joy. Um, and Maya Angelou. Uh, my mom was a huge Maya Angelou fan when I grew up. Uh, you know, we, we in my household, you know, we were introduced to black history very early. And I'm very thankful for that because I come it, my, a lot of my writing comes from a sense of pride. Mm -hmm. um, and Maya Angelou, she for me, she embodies that sense of of pride and being black and being a woman and being strong and not ascertaining to what society feels that you should be being free, you know. Um, I love her story too. Um, mm -hmm. I love the fact that you know she grew up in a in a in a space where she not to, not to get too graphic into uh, what she had to to go through when she was a child, but she grew up in a space where she was not cared for, and she became probably one of the greatest poets, in my opinion, that the world has ever seen. Great so much where she actually spoke for Barack Obama's inauguration. Like that that says a lot when you're speaking for a pre presidential inauguration. Um, but yeah, those are some of my favorites simply because they embody things that are very important to me. Um, you know, that sense of history and the pride in, you know, being being black in America. You know, we, we have a, a huge. There's a huge. Um, I'm trying to put it in the right words. Uh, we have in historically, there's a lot that black people have had to endure being in America, particularly being a woman in America. And I tend to. Um, lean towards poets that um, recognize and put a voice to, to that. So thank you for sharing those, you know, your favorites. So for some people, those names may be new, you know, so for our, maybe for our younger audience or for even, you know, our older audience, um, we may have to go back and look at those names and, and pull them up. So definitely for those who are viewing us live and those who are watching us by replay, um, pay attention to those names that you're going to want to go back and make connections to those works and see those themes of freedom, those themes of, of liberation, those themes that, um, talk about our history and our culture and give us that um, pride and those stories that sustain us and strengthen us. And so we find all of those things in, in our poetry and in the stories um, that we share. So um, thank you for highlighting um, those persons um, for us, Heather. So you 
have um there's this poem in your book that said um entitled i didn't think i'd miss you as much as i did <laughs> um why was that special to you or what led you to write that particular piece if you don't mind my asking sure no um so in my early 20s my father passed away and it was extremely abrupt it was unexpected he wasn't sick um he didn't go through a series of surgeries, things like that, that, you know, you normally see when someone, you know, may, may leave and move on to the next realm. And it had a huge impact on my, my young adulthood. So when I wrote that piece, um, it was where I put myself back into that space of what happened on that day. And a lot of my works, just like this piece, tend to reflect on um, a sense of loss and what I've done to get myself through that loss and um, reestablish myself. So in that particular piece, um, like it was written, you know, based on like the loss of my father and um, all the many emotions that I went through in losing him. And um, and just to be frank with you, when I did lose my father, I, I left the country. I went to South America. I didn't talk. <laughs> I, all I did was write. And that was one of the pieces that I started when I was there. Um, but the thing about that particular piece, and I don't know, I, I don't I don't really read that piece too often because it does bring those, mm -hmm. those memories back. But the thing about that piece is that there's a sense of triumph in there. There's a sense mm -hmm. of, I can get through this. There's a sense of, you know, um, holding on to my faith in order to, to get through this. And I think um, that's probably the most important aspect of that piece. But yeah, it, it, I wrote it because of my the passing of my father and um, trying to help myself remember who who I am and what I was my purpose is here. Well, look, that is that's powerful, and that is encouraging, and it has impact for just so many different reasons as to like the healing aspects of writing, um, the space that the process of writing um, gives to us, um, the expression and the why of why we write in the moments that we do write and how we come out of that moment of writing or how we um, come into the next moment as a result of our writing that, okay, now we're in a healed place or now we've gotten into, we've moved from this part of grieving to the next, or now we're all the way on the other side of this time and we, we find, you know, our joy, or we remember, you know, the good, or we're able to continue in the journey without necessarily being stuck, or we're able to get unstuck. So I hope that has been, you know, your a part of your um, process with this brown liquor memories that you've just been able to, you know, you know, show the us show us your journey and show us um, your story. And you've revealed so much. And that piece was a powerful piece. Thank you. Um, and I was glad I was able to um, read it <laughs> for myself <laughs> and to know the, you know, to get the story behind it is just um, great to have. Um, can you share another piece um, with our audience? Sure. Absolutely. Um, I'll actually share the title piece, which is Brown Looker Memories. Um, I put it at the very end of the book simply because, to, like to your point, um, this, the trajectory of the collection of poetry is about, you know, going through loss and getting unstuck. Um, so that's that's why I put that at the end. To be complicated is a curse. To love like breathing is a punishment. To be selfless is near extinction. To be understood is like putting the vastness of the universe in a thimble. We are a work of art. We are coveted. We are tossed aside because we are complex. We are a beacon of good intent. We are the phoenix in every I love you like. 
the messy remnants of near perfection spilled but never wasted. We are the memories of those unaware of what they want, only what they like at the moment. We are the reminders that life happens, but we never cease living. And the meaning is to simply be a good person despite the twists of lemon. Woo! <laughs> Look, look, this is look, this the stuff that makes you want to go, look, have, pull out the glass, mm -hmm. <laughs> take a little, take, have a little shot right there. <laughs> brown liquor memories, brown mm -hmm. liquor um, memories. So thank you for sharing mm -hmm. um, that piece with us. So what is something that you hope that readers will take away from your book? Uh, you know, I hope readers would take away the fact that no matter what life throws at you, there's always light on the other side of that tunnel. Whether you get there through prayer, meditation, holding on to your faith or a lucky coin in your pocket, you can always get through anything life throws your way. Um, I've known quite a few people in my life that have gone through some of the darkest moments I've ever seen based on loss of a loved one, based on trying to get through their own addictions, depression, things like that. And um, I hope that that's something that those out there who may be struggling with those types of things in their life um, can take away. There's always uh, positivity. There's always, there's always something sweet, no matter how bitter or how dark or how evil something seems, there's always gonna be something better out there. And you speak so much with, I mean, you speak of history, you speak of family, you you speak of, you know, just the journey of life and, and relationships um, in your work. Um, how does, you know, poetry itself as a form speak to you and how do you use, stay true to your voice in your work? My family, my friends. Um, poetry has always been a vehicle for me to find my true authentic self. It's where I can um, bear all of the pieces that, of me that sometimes I don't even want to look at. Um, it's where I can take a look at the things I've been through and say that I'm a better person because of it. And it doesn't make me any less of anyone, any lesser than anyone else because I've gone through it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a vehicle for me. Um, I stay true to my authentic self because, um, there are times where I go back and I reread my pieces, whether it's something that is currently published or something that I've written for someone else that they've given to someone else. Um, or whether it's, you know, a conversation with friends and family and we speak about, you know, history, we speak about current events, you know, there's a lot going on in the world right now. And a lot of those things um, will continue to repeat. You know, history is always bound to repeat. My, my dad used to always say that. Um, and those are the ways that I, I kind of stay authentic to myself. You know, self-reflection is, is a very powerful tool that I think a lot of us uh, could stand to, to do more of. And um, it's it provides you with that sense of breaking, breaking that facade off and making sure that, you know, you are providing your, th your true authentic self um, at all times. And um, it's hard. It can be difficult. Uh, I try to do it as much as possible. And when I find myself getting a little ahead of myself, my friends and family have no problems um, sh holding that mirror up and saying, Hey, this is, this is not who you are. This is who you are. Um, this is not who you are. You may want to take a step back, you know? So uh, those are just some ways, you know, friends and family are very important, super important in, in, in faith, holding on to faith, no matter what your faith is, whether you're an atheist, Baptist, Catholic, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a Baptist and I wear a, a St. Christopher medallion. Um, but those are, those are some ways I stay authentic to myself, you know, just making sure I keep things in perspective. And look, piggybacking on that, as you, you know, talking about, you know, family and then talk the support of family and friends um as well as taking that time for self reflection um what are some other tips that you could provide for um aspiring um 
poets and authors who may be looking to publish or to um, perform or to do, you know, perform in a, as spoken word artists? Um, the first thing that comes to mind is always going to be authenticity. Be true to yourself um, because no one else can be you. Only you can show who you are. Um, taking time to make sure when you're writing, um, you get it right. You know, um, taking that time to truly say what it is that you're trying to say, whether, you know, you're angry and it's just a piece about, you know, wanting to get that anger out. There's nothing wrong with that. Get the anger out. Say all the things you want to say. Don't hold back. Um, I would say those are probably the two most important things. Um, and lastly, I would say, look to your predecessors, you know, there are so many writers out there, so many spoken, spoken word artists out there, so many artists in general um, that have experienced the exact same, if not similar feelings that, you know, aspiring writers um, have experienced. And I like to look back at works of like Amiri Baraka or Saul Williams, Sonia Sanchez. You know, mm -hmm. I like to look at those works and I like to read them because it puts me in the mindset of, if you can get through it, I can too, you know? Um, if they can write about it this way, how can I take a look at their work and maybe try to remix it in a, in a mm -hmm. sense, you know? Um, I think it's very important to know where you came from. I've always been a, an advocate for knowing where you came from, which is probably why I'm so um, so invested in, in history. Um, but yeah, I, I think those are three very important things, your authenticity, making sure you're saying what you wanna say, how you wanna say it, not holding back no matter who your audience is going to be and looking to your predecessors, because, you know, um, there's a lot, there's a lot there. There's a lot in, in other works. Um, there's a lot in other voices um, that, I don't know. I'm all for, you know, being creative, but I'm also mm -hmm. all for um, taking a look at the world around you, even if it's looking at a, a, a painting and using that as inspiration. So speaking of inspiration and thinking about um, thinking about art or, you know, nature or any of that, um, when I say representation matters, um, what does that mean to you, especially, you know, for this collection of um, poetry that you've written, Brown Liquor Memories? Um, that's a... That's a deep, deep question. Representation matters because because I think it has it holds so much in those two words. Um, to me, it means being able to have a sense of pride in who you are as a person, as a writer, as male or female, and being able to see your reflection, um, being able to feel heard. Um, being able to be um, a person that is relatable. Um, I think, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I, that's, I'm gonna go with that aspect because I don't wanna get political um, because there, like I said, there's so many, there's so many thoughts that come to my mind when you say representation matters. It reminds mm -hmm. me of a conversation I had with my daughter not long ago and she picked up a doll and it was a white doll, blonde hair, blue eyes. And in, in our household, you know, I tend to buy brown dolls. And but I would never tell her that she can't have the white doll. But I did ask, well, why is it that you want the doll? It's pretty. OK. And so, you know, I'm OK. Fine. We can buy that. If, if as long as that's the only reason why you want it, it's because it's pretty. We can buy that. But I also explained to my daughter that it's also nice to have faces around you that look like you because for so long, we didn't have the choice of having faces that look mm -hmm. like us in in a lot of avenues, whether it be in writing, whether it be in toys that we play with, whether it be on television mm -hmm. um, or in cartoons or TV shows or whatever. And I think that's very important because it shows children, aspiring writers, aspiring artists, whomever, it shows them that, you know, there's space for you because it's been made, because there someone has already been in those in that place to leave those footsteps for you to follow or leave those footsteps for you to start walking in and then branch off and create something completely different. Um, so I, 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 like I said, I have a lot of thoughts when it comes to representation matters, but those are the, the ones that immediately pop into my mind. Like, you know, having that, that, that space there um, for someone that, that looks like you. 
someone that maybe, you know, have has gone through the same experiences you've gone through. Um, someone that has had the same um, victories that you've had as mm -hmm. well and being able to celebrate in, in that um, sense of the word. So Heather, can you share with us one last piece? Uh, sure. Uh, let's see. I think I will do There was one I wrote for my grandmother um, not long ago. Uh, my grandmother is very instrumental on my mother's side of the family, um, more so because, you know, grandparents, I don't think get as much respect as they used to when I was growing up. When I was growing up, um, grandparents were the end all be all mm -hmm. of you know, where the family starts and where the family ends. And I think now um, the sense of having a grandparent, it just isn't the same. We have people now and no, you know, no shade to anyone mm -hmm. at all. You know, family dynamic is family di dynamic, but we have grandparents now that are 40, 50 years old mm -hmm. and don't necessarily know what it means to be a grandparent. Mm -hmm. They don't know what it means to be a matriarch or a patriarch of a family. They just know that they have children that have had children and, um, Again, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Mm -hmm. But my grandparents were very old school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was there was Mahalia Jackson on Sundays, and mm -hmm. um, there was there was you know Sunday dinners, and there was church. Mm -hmm. They never missed church. My grandmother never missed church. Anytime you saw my grandmother, she had a cross for her puzzle, a mini bottle of water in her Bible. Um, and they, they they don't make grandparents like that anymore. I don't mm -hmm. think. Um, so I wrote this for my grandmother after um, after she she passed away. <laughs> Um, if I can find it, sorry about that. I should have had it already pulled up here. I'm trying to scroll through my phone. I should have got the book instead. It probably would have been a whole lot easier to find. Uh, no, that's not it. Sorry about that. I don't want to take up, just leave the... um. No, look, no problem at all. No problem at all. I think what you said about grandparents and the role that they play uh, is very important. I know for me personally, I was blessed to have both sets um, of, you know, my maternal grandparents and my paternal grandparents coming up. And, you know, even though, I mean, they lived on like different sides of the, t the states. And so we would rotate, you know, we go to this set of grandparents for Christmas and mm -hmm. this set of parent grandparents on Thanksgiving. But, you know, you knew, you know, how things were going to be when you got to their house. Mm -hmm. you, knew Absolutely. The, you knew the rules for coming in and out the house without slamming doors. That's right. And you <laughs> knew when to be in, um, inside, and you knew to what you was, you know, to set the table and to, you needed to wash your hands. And, you know, there were all of these things that you knew that you were supposed to do because, your grandma said it, or your, That's right. your grandfather said it, and you know, you know, um, it's like my grandfather had this thing for um, Pepsi's and crackling bread, and oh. <laughs> I'm like, what? It was like that's some kind of crazy combination, and um, but you know, he had those bottles that you recycle, you know, mm -hmm. pack recyclable bottles of Pepsi. And, you know, and that was his, you know, that was his thing. But we weren't, we knew better than the, we weren't going to mess with his Pepsi. That's right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> everything was, everything was very uh, routine when he came to the grandparents' house. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so this one is called, um, I'm thinking of you. On a cold autumn afternoon, listening to the last few knocks, last few light knocks of my car's engine settling, door cracked. I can feel the cold creeping in, peeling back the layers of warmth, seeping into my bones. It was two hours later, and as you lay, family scattered around you like leaves. I planted a kiss on your still warm, flawless skin. It reminded me of summer afternoons. Watching you eat salted green apples, peeking at your crosswords, things will never be the same. They haven't been since. Ooh, 
child. I felt every bit of that because it made me think of the like the last thing I did for my own grandmother. So just, you know, thank you for, you know, sharing that memory and that that feeling, um, that connection, that that family, that sense of relationship yes. with us. So thank you so much for that. Absolutely. Um, can you tell our viewers, our listeners, those who catch the re replay, how they can connect and follow you on social media and how they might, you know, purchase your book? Absolutely. Um, so I am on Instagram at the right Heather. It's T H E W R I T E um, Heather, spelled H E A T H E R. Um, I'm also on Twitter at the same the right Heather. Uh, my book is actually available on Amazon currently. It's available in paperback or ebook, um, and it's called Brown Liquor Memories. All right. So you can check her out on our Instagram and Twitter handles and also um, catch that book, um, Brown Liquor Memories, on Amazon. So definitely you want to follow her. I encourage you to follow her and check out um keep up with what she's doing. Um, do you have any projects that you're working on now or you got something, you know, that, that you can tease our audience with? I have a couple of things that I'm working on right now. There's one children's book that I'm working on um, for body positivity. Um, it's actually my daughter's idea. So I may just publish it under her name instead of under my name. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And I'm working on a second installment to Brown Liquor Memories as well. So I probably won't finish that until uh, 2022. Well, you've heard it here first, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> you've heard it here first that Heather Camille's got something new and fresh that will be coming out. So you definitely want to follow her on her social media so you know, can keep up with the reveal because when it drops, you want to be the first to pick it up. And especially, you know, looking at a sequel or follow up to the Brown Liquor Memories, as well as to the children's books that she'll have in the works and whatever comes next. She's a, it's been a great um, time being able to spend this um, afternoon with you, Heather. And we're thanking you greatly for stopping by on the far side to hang out with us. And we wish you continued success with Brown mm -hmm. Liquor Memories and all the other wonderful projects that you've got coming up. Thank you so much, Monica. It's been a pleasure. All right. So to our viewing audience and those who will catch the replay, we want you to make sure that you're staying tuned to the Farside Co-Ed Book Club Facebook page for more author interviews and posts as we celebrate National Poetry Month during the month of April. So until next time, many roots, many voices are a part of the infinite story. So plant your seed. Have a great day.